Hi there. Welcome to the More Simple Podcast. This is a podcast for Blacks, Asians, and those who love them. I am Mo, and I am your host, ready to spark your curiosity as I take you on this adventurous ride of exploring cultures through the stories of my guests from all over the world. On this show, we get really personal, discussing salient issues that are relevant to our contemporary age and also building community around them. As our guests exercise courage and vulnerability in sharing their life's experiences, we hope that in turn, you are inspired by them and that you get the courage in it to set your own stories free. Enjoy the ride and thank you so much for listening. Welcome back to the show. This is Mo, and I am super honored that I have this particular guest on the show today because um, knowing them has been, I think, one of the highlights of my podcasting journey. Uh, some of you, well, if you listen to the podcast a lot, you probably know him by now, like Mr. Kenny. And so today I have the sweet pleasure of talking to his wife, um, Tutu Popola, and together they are a dynamic duo. They are their parents to Olivia and Chubby Chicks. Peter, Olivia is a queen, by the way, and then Peter with the Chubby Chicks. And Tutu Popola, she's the lead consultant and founder of Sleek HR, and I'll search HR consulting for startups, scale ups, and big corporations. Businesses hire her to help them make sense of how United Kingdom employment law impacts them, how they can remain compliant, and build a great people experience for their employees from entry to exit. And you can tell she does it because she loves it. And according to her, she will do almost anything for delicious food, including a balloon, a good book, and a latte. <laughs> so everyone join me welcome um, to, to I call her Mama Pope. Well, to, to, to the podcast. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, Mo. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. And it's lovely to see you on a recorded show. You guys have been on the show probably three times, so... And three times now. It seems like three times. It seems like, right? yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, it might be two, but it feels like three times. Because you guys are so involved and, you know, of course, you're huge supporters of the show. So it's always nice to have this you know, conversation. And I know today we're going to be talking about something different from parenting, which is usually what we've been talking about. You know? mm-hmm. So um, so you reached out to me and, and I think by virtue of your work, you really have the desire to contribute to the ongoing conversation about, you know, workplace professionalism and really helping um, Gen Z to um, leverage their strengths and I think tweak their weaknesses to be more efficient in the workplace. So because we're going to be talking about Gen Z, for the sake of people who do not know, because sometimes, you know, Gen Z, X, Y, Z, you know, it's all lost in the mix. And I wonder what name they're going to give to this you know, new generation coming. Is it like post-COVID generation? I don't know. I hope for not. sake of those... I know because it's just gonna be worse. Um, for the sake of those who don't know, can you define the category of people classified as millennials and Gen Z, and what are some of the unique characteristics that they might have? Okay, so firstly, before I go into that, thank you for taking the time as well. Um, I really appreciate you, you know, spending your time, you know, listening to what I have to say, and you know, hosting me on your show. I know that your passion for podcasting is really very high, but you're doing so well. Uh, you're doing brilliantly, and I'm a an avid podcast listener. I've listened to quite a few of them, but I actually quite like yours. Um, but I think that you put a lot of effort into it in terms of your professionalism and you know the content creation. And I know it's not easy, but you're very consistent. So thank you for your time. I know you've also got a day job, so it can't be easy combining everything together. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's your time as well. So thank you. We can keep doing this back to back. Thank you. And you also have a podcast which we talk about towards the end. Okay. We can, you know find out a little bit more about that. I think it'd be nice for our listeners to go listen to your podcast. Oh, okay. I'll let them know why they should, they should listen to it towards the end. Okay, thank you. So, back to the question. So, you were asking about the millennials and Gen Z. Um, so, millennials are usually are categorized as people kind of within the age of 27 to 40, plus or minus one year. So, people born between 1980 and 1994. So there's been a few studies about it, and um, that's why I said plus or minus one year. 
because some would say it stops at a certain age, but let's just add that in, depending on who you listen to. And then the next group that we're talking about are the Gen Z, uh, those born 1995 to 2010. Um, so that's those aged between 11 and 26. So um, I'm sure you know where you fall in between these two. <laughs> 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 Let me just say that, like, kind of like with horoscopes, like, there's a th- like there was times I felt like it was, and I don't believe in those by the way. Okay. Was it Libra or Scorpio? They just keep yeah, yeah. I don't keep tabs on this. Yeah. But I also feel I should say my privilege shows when I talk to somebody and they're telling me I was born in 2000. I'm like, and they say and I'm like and there's an and after your age. Like, oh my gosh, how old am I? You know, my privilege is showing right now. Yeah, I think I you I, I'll probably be a millennial. You know, okay. even though there's yeah. such a a bad rap associated with it, but. Yeah. I'll, I'll boldly accept to be a millennial. That's that's my categorization. Okay. Me too. I'm within the millennial. So, um, uh, in the, as yeah. far as... Yes, yes, yes. I think it's a very wide group. And, and wide. I know... It's quite wide. And there seems to be this monolithic um, overgeneralization of, you know, their features. So, can you just let us... What people, like, what are the stereotypes of people that are supposed to be millennials and versus Gen Z? So when we talk about millennial group, that's quite kind of like you've identified very wide. And I see some studies now where people are making a distinction between younger millennials and older millennials. And I'm thinking, oh, let's just not make this complicated. Why bother? Why bother? (laughs) But I can understand why um, they're making that distinction because firstly, the group is quite, the, the age range is very wide. Um, and there are some characteristics that may not cut across every age group. I would say that because we are humans as well, we can't like apportion uh, a certain characteristics to you know certain age group because obviously, by virtue of nature that we are humans, we would all have kind of in our own individual you know, perspective on things. So there's no broad kind of edge. But this is just like a categorization. Is how. The studies have been done so let's let's roll with it i would say yeah yeah so some of okay. the characteristics yeah uh, i think the one that i think is really broad across both groups is the social awareness which is what i quite find it quite interesting is what people refer to as being woke um so that can have that can have its positive connotation and it can be sometimes used as negative but I just go with the social awareness side of it, which is the generation of people who um, know what's going on in the world. They are asking for answers. They want to, they're interested in things like, you know, social justice, politics, um, wealth distribution. um, And they're looking at like a bigger picture of things, um, racial equality and how these things affect them. And they are quite rightly asking questions about you know why is this this way and why is that that way whereas you know in previous years sometimes i would think that previous generations just accepted that you know this is just how things are but they're saying actually no um this it shouldn't why is it that way what why what what are the inequality why are these inequalities the way they are so that questioning i think is a big part of something that i would say a big characteristic that i would say cuts across all the um these two generations so it can be positive and it can be negative it just depends on you know how um it's been channeled i would say and how and again the maturity of the people that are asking the questions i think you also determine whether or not you know you categorize that as you know good or bad but i don't like to go down the rules of something being good or something being bad because i know that there are some yeah. areas in the middle where you think actually yeah. maybe there's some sense in this so social awareness is something that cuts across. In terms of um, the workplace, there's also what we're seeing uh, around the management style preference for the, this, you know, age groups where uh, the command and control that's probably worked for maybe my parents' generation might not. It's not necessarily going to the going to work this time around. It's like okay. Um, if I can't express my opinion here and I can't, and you just tell me what to do and you expect me to just do it, then maybe this is not the place for me. Whereas previous generations probably think, well, I'm paying the bills here and 
I've got children at home. This is what I need street, to do here. The street's gotta eat. <laughs> yep. This is what I need to do. I'll just, you know, do it. Uh, they might go home and, and I'm sure they would go home and have a moan and whinge about things. But in that time, they'd probably just do what they need to do. Um, also, another thing is around learn expectation of what an employer does. It's an employer for, I would say, the younger millennial and the Gen Z is not just somebody that's there to provide the work and pay the salary. There's also an expectation. I think it's the same thing for brands as well in terms of the brands that this generation would engage with. Um, so either would they buy their clothes from there, asking questions like, are you a sustainable uh, brand or are you using sweatshops in India to produce my clothes and oh, we're not going to buy from you because your, your supply chain is not diverse and all that stuff and oh you didn't you didn't support um black black lives matter when it was happening we noticed that you were silent on it so <laughs> things like that are also you know, you know they're quite socially aware so they're ask, asking questions um uh, so that again is another you know categorization um characteristics i would say of um gen z slash younger millennials <laughs> oh my god that was that was really quite detailed Tito, thank you so much for the um, explanation and I definitely agree with what you said about how there's so many things that cut across those different generations because I feel like we focus much so much on our differences yeah because there's always you know millennials are this even when you hear the millennial when people talk about millennial almost like they're already even when I hear millennial I raise my eyes up like oh not even remembering that, okay, wait, you're under that category, right? You're, yeah, <laughs> you're there as well. And I think, if I could just add one more thing, uh, sometimes you can either, I don't know uh, how it is, you know, where you are in the US, but here in the UK, there's a the concept of the snowflake. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The snowflake generation, yeah. Sometimes, I think the way the word millennial is used, or woke, or Gen Z, it's like, oh, yeah, there's the snowflake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, and almost, if you don't know what snowflakes mean, just people that are almost think about snowflakes. By the time they hit the floor or the ground, they dissipate and they're not, you know. So people that have like really tender sensitivities, they're not robust. sensibilities. They're not robust and they're very fragile. They, their feelings get hurt easily. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that's a. I would say that's a negative because I think that when I think about some of the, and I'm sure we'll go into this later. Some of the things that you know, the issues that Gen Z and younger millennials have had to go through through this COVID period um, and some of the issues, economic issues, political issues that have happened and how it has affected them. I think we're quite far from being snowflakes um, because of the effect that they, these things have had. And somehow we've kind of weathered the storm, or shall I say still weathering the storm because the impact of those things are still kind of ongoing. So I don't okay. think snowflake is a... It's an accurate description, but then obviously everyone's got their own um, opinion on things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also have this opinion. Well, not to sound you know like I'm trying to like match a word for word. In that the generation before you, you're always going to have something to say. Of course, yeah. generations should have. There should be a, a way of doing things better with every generation. I imagine that the baby boomers, when the what was the other generation that came after the baby boomers? Was it the Gen X? You yeah. know, when they came, they probably had things to say about Gen X. Gen X will have things to say about millennials. Millennials will have things to say about Gen Z. There's always going to be that divide. But at the end of the day, we we'll forget that no matter, you know, what year we're born in, we're always going to have a lot in common. You know, we're all human, regardless of our age, our demographic, our any power. We all want to feel valued. Yeah. And I think it goes back to your point initially about what do we value? You know, they might have different ways of measuring that, you know, operationally defining what value means. Yeah, but then I think if we don't, you know, talk about what is important to this generation, and we just always keep looking at them through this broad categorization of stereotypes, we're missing the point. Because it, it is a lot to be learned from each generation, and I, um, I think that's going to form the end of my, you know, um, conversation yeah. when we wrap up. There's a lot we can learn from each generation. Of it's course. not as if one generation is better or, or worse. It's just you know differences, and time keeps changing, and a lot of the issues that these new generations are gasping with. They are because of the previous generations, like, you know, yeah. market collapse, you know, um, yeah, like, you know, inflation rates. 
guess who's been costing it, you know, over um, consumption of products. And so when Gen Z and millennials come and say, we want to focus on ethical issues, heck, they almost will collapse. I don't know if you heard about the pet food industry. They almost collapsed that industry single-handedly because they stopped buying from all these big, big brands. They started going for all these local, organically, you know, well, you know, sustainable, you know, yeah. brands to feed their pets. Gen Z, millennials, most of them want, don't want to have kids. They want to focus more on their pets and their careers. And, you know, so things that are really, really important to them. I was saying that that's not something the previous generation should learn from about how to be more connected to the source. You know, and I think that's a big thing we miss. When we just always talk about, oh, millennials, oh, Gen Z, oh, you yeah. know. I think no, there's something to be learned, you know, to be learned from from this generation because, say, let's take on the issue of sustainability, for example. Um, I think that we are quite keen on knowing where, for example, the food has come from, where the clothing is coming is come from, is it is it sustainable, and then there's the issue of sustainable fishing and all that. Previous generations, sometimes I think, from studies, have basically just harvested the the herds, for example, taking and taking and taking, and not putting anything not, back. Not putting enough back. I won't say they didn't put anything. Okay, but okay. Say let's show enough. enough. Let's balance it. Thank you for calling me out on that. Very so, true. I agree. I agree. Sure, um, I agree. Climate change and all that. That's now you know come on. I don't. Climate change is not anything new. It's just that the mm-hmm. discussion is you know come up um, more frequently now. More frequently. Yeah. I quite, sometimes I do wonder if the previous generation had done more. Maybe if they'd been woke, then we might not have need to be just dealing with, you know, some of these issues. And then, I mean, I'm not trying to sound political here, yeah, but some of the issues are political. Mm-hmm. And it's just how it is. So maybe there's something to be learned there. And what's that saying? If you know better, you do better. Mm-hmm. So let's say it wasn't a big discussion then and it wasn't, you know, there was not a lot of people of that those kind of talks going on then now that it's come to the forefront we're talking about it instead of discounting it, discounting it all together should we be saying actually is there something in this and what can i do um agreed pick the bits agreed. that is relevant to you and then you know we're not we're not saying change everything that you've always done but if there's something that you're doing and you think okay maybe i need to look a little bit into my um electricity usage for example maybe there's something i can do that's fine i know that's one with the food this is what i struggle with eating less meat i'm not sure how on an night <laughs> exactly my, my sure father is not, not they did not go hunter gatherer for a reason for me to start eating plants alone i i get the health you know um implications that can help have on you but to kind of go you know green totally um my stomach can handle it <laughs> it's just um, and i think, I think it's habits like I don't think I don't see how I can go on a plant based diet mainly. Um, I yeah. can't cut back my meat eating, but as you know, being a Nigerian, that is a lot of mm. meat. <laughs> Good for you. And as we everyone, you know, talking, I, it just don't know me like there's always going to be a balance. When a generation heads in a particular direction, the generation coming after it will probably go into opposite direction to balance things out. Like we're seeing now that a lot of, you know, like the millennials, they tend to have, well, these are over, you know, generalizations, by the way. They tend to have more liberal, you know, um, free-spirited views about things. But studies are showing now that Gen Zs are becoming a bit more conservative compared to their millennial groups. So I think things are just, things find a way of balancing things out. We just have to see how we can learn and do better. Now, you've been using wokeness for, for a while, and I want to know, how is this wokeness of these groups and of people reflected in your work ethics? Do you think it works favorably or to them for them or otherwise? Well, it depends on the maturity of the person um, that's woke, if we use that word. Um, so I think that there are some things that are happening. So the first example would be around diversity and inclusion. So I run uh, my own HR consultancy. Uh, I work in HR and some especially following the George Floyd's um uh, matter a lot of questions have been asked at work around why are we not diverse so um employees are asking questions to say well why is this you know company why are we very white why where are the where and this is these are issues you know that are coming up where, where are the, where's the ethnic diversity and why do we why don't we have um uh, a good racial distribution at top management. 
So we were, so there are questions that are currently being asked. Um, and also people are having issues around microaggressions at work. I mean, none of that is new, but I feel like with the, shall I say, global awakening that has happened, um, there's been a bit more uh, questions being asked around that. And people who probably in the past would not have raised a grievance before, a formal grievance or made a complaint, are now doing so, say, actually, why do I have to put up with it? While we are on this George Floyd matter, can you also look into, you know, somebody is raising a, might be raising a question around, you know, their perception of their colleagues about them, or maybe they're saying, actually, um, they're questioning their office dress code. I mean, thankfully, there's just a few offices left that still have dress codes. Dress codes, That's yeah. another question. That's another matter altogether. Like, why? Like, just why, why do you need one? But, you know, things like hair um, for black women, um, what constitute professional hair, professional hairstyles, um, and what doesn't. And these are conversations that so, most of them I've never had before relating to work. I've had them socially, but not at work. So a lot of work now that I'm doing, uh, I would say in the last year, I've done a lot of work around diversity and inclusion, um, data gathering, um, why are black people, for example, not going beyond a certain level within your company? Why are they exiting? Or why are they just in the same role for X number of years? Uh, and what can you do about it? So there's a political angle to it. I try not to go too much into that you know, at work, because obviously there'll be a diverse opinion on that. And sometimes I don't find it really helpful. And also, I don't want to get sucked in. I just want to know what can we do about it and what's the appetite for it um, from senior management. So I would say most of these issues that I've highlighted are being raised by Gen Z, people at work, and I would say some younger millennials. I love it because it just makes my work that little bit more interesting that what it uh, was before. Uh, and also, there are questions being raised around uh, benefits. So what an employer is providing. Um, I'm, we're at the stage now where for a few of my clients, we are reviewing what kind of benefits are we providing. So you're giving um, X number of holidays above what we would say the statutory minimum is, but also your staff are probably saying what we want is mental health support and mental health days <laughs> <laughs> what about some proper mental health support and interestingly what about it one thing that I want uh, uh, that I found quite interesting was that around the diversity of the mental health support that they're requesting as well I've never had to do this before but I've had to source for um, like a diverse diverse counsellors and therapists because people are saying, and quite rightly, they're saying, okay, I've got these issues that I want to discuss. Most of the people that were on our books are probably white female. But some of my issues, they might not be able, they're cultural. They might not be able to relate to it. So the role of the employer, I see that it's changing from just being a provider of work and uh, someone, you know, paying of salary and getting people to work. But also, they're doing a lot more than I would say they've done in the past. So that, that I think is really interesting in terms of the, that dynamic. So that wokeness is not just, thankfully, it's not just um, a negative political. Thing. It's not just a negative yeah. thing. It also is filtering into like the day-to-day um, affairs of how you know, organizations are being run. Now, back to your question of whether is, it can sometimes be seen as negative, yes, because... Number one, it depends on how receptive the employer is. Um, if they're not very receptive, you're just going to be banging your head against the wall most of the time, which is why when I start having the conversation, I always ask them, how open, how far do you want us to push the boat? So that I know how far we really, you know, in terms of how I'm going to advise them on, you know, what, what we're going to do. And um, because it's in the age of social media as well, employers, some, some of them are quite rightly quite cautious. Because you want to manage any reputational that any risk of reputational yeah. damage. So when you say no, Facebook. Yeah. When you say no, you want to say that no, you know, but say it no because <laughs> um or maybe not no, maybe you say not now. Not now. Let's look into it because the last thing you want is somebody one of your staff, <laughs> you know, quitting on Twitter 
I say, all right. I'm tagging, I'm tagging you and you start trading the hashtag. Yeah, and then if you have like clients and customers on social media, you don't want that bad rep, do you? So, no. And also, I don't know if you've noticed that, you know, some people who have maybe racist views and share them on social media, people would go and search for them on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah. Even the employers, yeah. yeah and then, and then, um, and then send it to the employer to say, oh, is this the kind of person you want to have on your payroll? Is this your view as well? So some employers will go into a bit of a panic and fire them and say, no, I can't have it. Like a new jerk reaction. Like new and of jerk course, there's also that problem of cancel culture, like how far we're taking it. But I, I do understand. And I think as you were talking, it made me realize that one thing we're learning from this, you know, um, Gen Z and millennial generation is that Work isn't just a place you go in nine to five. No. Work is part of life. You, and, it, and it makes sense. We're spending a huge and integral part of our life working. Why do we have to make that dichotomy, dichotomy between work and then home life? Whatever, like almost like they're trying to have that marriage and that fusion of, of, of like oneness of the, of the soul as it were. Yeah. You know, and I think that consciousness is it's healthy in a way because if we're going to be at work for this, then it has to be a place that I'm, I feel joyful at, you know, yeah. a place that I feel like my life is not just, you know, ebbing away. They, they give us that consciousness that I don't think a lot of the previous generation, because for them it was about work, you know, we put food on the table and that, and those are not necessarily bad things, but those are like, I think, major differences between the older generation and the, um, the newer ones. Yeah, I agree with yeah. you. Um, yeah. But that also has a downside to it. It does, yeah, definitely. The, the downside to wanting to have like a marriage between your work life and your home life is if things are not working as you would expect at work, it can be very stressful. Um, yeah. Someone has described stress as the as a as an ongoing pandemic, so um, it can be really stressful, and that can have an impact on your mental health as well um, in terms of how you how you are able to manage that relationship if it doesn't go in the direction that you want it to go. You can't, you can't. Or you perceive, I you even perceive yourself. You can reduce like your self-esteem. Yeah. It can also lead to like, you know, suicide rates as well because work and life become that big, you know, blur, like this big mess of a thing. So yes, there are, there are downsides to all of this. They're not like, you know, utopian philosophies. They do have their issues. Oh, they do. And sometimes, yeah. it, it, sometimes because of what's happening, because there's an heightened sense of you know political happenings and social happenings that everything is very heightened at the moment you can have an unrealistic ex- expectation of your employer as well you're asking them to do yeah. things you're asking them to do things and they're saying we're not big enough to be able to do all we can't it's almost like you want to put it on them to change the world and sometimes depending on some of these things do cost money and i'm not saying they shouldn't spend money they should but yeah you yeah. need to be able to balance it out in terms of are my expectations too high? Am I trying to put everything on them? You yeah. know, to do. And some might say, actually, I, we don't have to do any of this. Um, the next question I had for you was this Gen Z and part of the millennial generation are the people of the digital age. You know, technology and social media has greatly influenced their daily interactions. Yeah. On the other hand, there's an older generation whose lives have completely were completely different at the same age, leading to a huge generational gap. Can you talk about some of the issues that occur in the workplace as a result of this divide? So, at the moment, there is a, I don't know, should I say, depending on what kind of organization is it, it is, there's probably at least three generations. In a workplace? In a workplace right now. Now, if you think that those generation, they, they all have something good to bring to the table, by the way. So they're all bringing good stuff to the table, but also they all have their individual characteristics. So there may be a clash there in terms of first expectations. So let's start with the social issues that we're just talking about now. So younger millennials, Gen Z are coming up to say, you know, we need to do, so we need social, we need to do social action. We need to be involved, you know, in these debates. We need to be putting things on our social media page um, to say we're in support of Black Lives Matter, for example. We need to be acting in the way that shows that we are, not just, you know, performative action, but also actually doing stuff. Yeah. 
Now, older generation, some of them may agree with that. And then some of them might think, well, that's not why we're here. We're here to work and get paid. Okay, we can do a little bit of this social you know, justice thing on the side, but we're here to get paid. So there's already a problem there because one side might feel like the, the other side is not fully supportive um, of their own, you know, perspective. And that might kind of lead to some sort of frustration. Um, another thing is around um, career adva- advancement. So, so the first one I described was like, a, I would say generational, you know, tension. And also that might then create um, a problem around mentoring. So the older generation have probably done this, you know, obviously long, long enough. They, they feel like they know better. On some things I would agree, on some things I don't, because there are some of their ways in terms of how they want to go about things that are kind of being phased out. We might not even need digital revolution has come on and we might not really need to go through all that stuff anymore because you can have an app for that. There's an app for everything now. There's an app for everything. There's yeah. an app for everything now. But also, in ter- but there's some things that you need to, you still need to, like relationship building. They, they, can, they can never be an app for that. Those are social skills that you would have to, you know, learn. Resilience is something that, some things that you only pick up by experience. Um, you can be highly intelligent, but in terms of your social skills, you still need to. You know, learn some of that. So I think there might be a tension in terms of whether or not they feel like they are able to mentor you know, the young, their younger colleagues. And when I say mentoring, I don't mean mentoring in the formal sense of it, or maybe in the formal sense of it, but sometimes there's some informal mentoring that's, say, yeah. mm-hmm. that's going on yeah. at work as well. But if you if they feel like you think you know everything, then I think, well, actually, fine, you go and do it then. So there's that tension that goes there. Whereas, and on, and on, on some cases, it might be that some of them might just take down board and say, okay, let's just do it however way we can. Now, social media is another thing where the, there might be uh, a bit of social media overload and Gen Z or younger millennials might think, I should be doing this by now. I should be at a certain level because they think that, you know, they should have, had, maybe rightly or wrongly, they might think that they should have advanced a little bit higher. And they might feel like the older generation that they work with are in the way, which may or may not be the case. Again, depending on what kind of organizations it is, most public sector organizations, for example, after a certain number of years, you get promoted to a certain level. Younger people don't want to do that. They don't care. They won't, they won't stay long enough. Four or five years, they're out. Yeah, they're out. They're like, I've got a plan. I have a plan. <laughs> you know? This is what I want to achieve. And I'm not hanging around, you know, to be able to move up the, move up. So if you the guys want to be there, you guys want to be there. How much notice have I got to leave? One month? Yeah, that's my, well, if they leave a notice, or they might just <laughs> be gone. <laughs> so, it's a really delicate balance sometimes to have in terms of, okay, what do these people want? What do they need to be able to succeed at, you know, succeed at work? Um, and what kind of learning can they pick up? What can they learn, you know, as they're here now? But if you, if there's an expectation that they just kind of learn on the job. They don't want to do that only. They also want an employer to be actively invested in, you know, teaching them, you know, putting them on the right kind of Training, courses yeah, mentoring, to make sure that yeah. they are gaining the right kind of skills within that short period of time when they're there. So yeah, yeah. the employer's role in balancing all of this, I can't say it's easy. So you have to attract them first. And then retain them. them. <laughs> another, another set of things you need to do to, to retain them. So it's not just about yeah. attracting them, but also retaining them as well. Yeah, uh, I very agree. Important. I agree. And I, and I think that it's why it, they prefer salary over benefits. Because benefits is something that might accrue over time. A lot of Gen Z millennials, they don't want to work for you for more than two to four years on average. And I think the onus is on um, companies to understand the, because they want the diverse workplace, right? Of opinions, of, you know, how to build the workforce. And I believe that there's something we can learn from each of the generation is understanding what their preferences are and at best making it very collaborative. Not that you teach one, you treat one group as, you know, special, handle with special, no. But at least understanding what they value and providing some flexibility. 
like we know that for Gen Z, their ideal, ideal workplace is, you know, after seeing their parents deal with the effect of the 2007-2008 financial crisis, job security is very, very important for them. Um, but while even at work, they want some flexibility in the way they're able to do the task. They yeah. might prefer flexible work hours. And they also prioritize, you know, companies that, you know, uphold social responsibility and diversity. For millennials, it's a little bit different. They are very, you know, tech savvy. They want to adopt new social media platforms quickly than older generation. They may prefer to send you emails rather than just walk up to you and talk to you or call you. You might call them and be like, why are you calling me? This is where, just email, you know. So issues like that, even though they're not really big issues, there are still some things that are very important to this, you know, group. It's understanding yes, and seeing how. And, and if you cannot, you know, sorry, go ahead, you go ahead. And just on the issue of stick, of sticking around long enough, I think there was a study, I think it was by PwC, that most Gen Z are probably not going to stick around a lot. They're not going to stick around, you know, with one employer because they don't see themselves as working for only maybe three employers in their career. They see themselves as, you know, it's like a continuous bargaining exercise for them. And also they want a lot of flexibility. They want to, once they see somebody else that's doing what they want, they're off, they'll go there. And part of the advice for employers in that is that to create an alumni network of some kind to make it look like it's okay if you want to leave and still come back because there's a lot of skills that they have or that they're going to pick up from this exploration, should I call it, that they're doing that would still be relevant to their employers, you know, in, in the future. So if, you, so if you just say, put your cards on the table from the beginning to say, this is what we're offering here and give them an opportunity to input into that process, but also have a network where it's um, they, I think someone's described them as a boomerang generation. <laughs> <laughs> Not boomer, boomerang. They come have back a, and hit have you. A, have, a, have, have a network where, okay, if you guys want to come back, you know, there is a network here and we will see what we have for you then. I think employers can gain or businesses can gain something from, from that. Um, but don't expect them to stick around forever and think, oh, you know, they're going to go through the ranks. They probably won't. Um, they may, but most of them won't. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them are not very keen on money, like, you know, oh, salary, salary. I want to earn a particular. For them, life is best lived, like, through experiences, rich experiences. And that might be scary for a lot of our parents' generation where money meant security. But the value system has changed a little bit because they've seen what money can do. You have it and then financial market happened and then everybody lost a lot of stuff. Yep. So I think there's so many things that, you know, we're all part of this circle, cause and effect. So you can't just isolate one group and be like, oh, you guys are like this without accounting for the fact that, well, what well, some of the things that happened because of you guys that made these guys like this. So I guess we're all complicit in this together. I have a couple more questions yeah. I, I hear your opinion about. And you've kind of really talked about it before, but so young people these days are more vocal and passionate about social justice, racial issues, mental health, you know, services in, you know, incorporated in the workplace. Also issues like, you know, inclusivity and diversity and rather right for companies that support any of these purposes. What can employers and, you know, organizations large or small can they do to position themselves to meet the demands of their young, you know, um, staff population, younger staff population? I think they need to be open um, to different ways of doing things. Um, they might have some of their own ideas, but I think they need to be more open to um, some of these new ideas. They also need, that then means that they also need to become socially aware themselves so they know what's going on. It's not enough for you to say, you know, we do computer programming there and that's all we're going to focus on. They also need to um, be aware, find out if you don't know, employ people like me to find out for you. <laughs> and then also bring their um, bring their employees on board and say, this is what we want to do, what you think. Or what you rather have us do. Have surveys, ask questions. And the thing is, when they tell you, when they give you their opinions, make it count. So don't let it be another annual or biannual survey and like that just gets fired somewhere and then nobody does anything about it because the next time you come to ask the same questions again, they're gone because they told, they told you the last time you've actually not done anything about it so I think those are the two main that's those are like the two foundational matters be open and also you keep a break of what you as well because when you're open then that's when you can get all these ideas and then you can position yourself to be um, should I say a leading employer or a great way, a great place to work? 
um, culture is also very important. My, the days of micromanagement are over because if you think about um, the way the lockdown, we've been in lockdown in the UK now for over a year and everybody has been working from home and we're beginning to, institutions are beginning to ease up now. But if you think about it, if you've been able to work from home for this last one year, just have some faith that they actually know what they're doing. Um, Say louder for the people at the back, please. <laughs> <laughs> the days of micro, like micro, I wanted to know what someone is doing every single minute of the day. It's, it's over. Just look at outputs. Look at out, only employ people that you actually trust. I think that's a good way to start. And look at the outputs. Uh, is what getting done? Then that's great. It's not for you to say, oh, I tried to, you know, I emailed you one hour, 10 seconds ago. I haven't had a response. That means you're not at your desk. Those days are over. Just let it go. <laughs> I like G, like Frozen said, let it go. Very, very good point. And um, I mean, you. those are amazing points to do because, and I and I definitely agree with a lot of what you said. Um, for If you want to employ people, they have to be trust, right? If you don't trust me, then don't employ me. Yep. And I think the, the, the strength of an organization lies in being able to understand the characteristics of these different generations and how to ensure that everybody reaches their potential. You give me a task to run with, let me use my strength, my personality, yes. my talent yes. to get it done. It might not be the way you want it done, but you want these results, right? We were, we're going to buy into the vision of the company. Everybody knows what the vision is, what the mission is. We have a goal, so work with the goal at the end. Work backwards with the goal in mind and then let that you know, talent shine. And it might, it, might, it might take different ways of doing it, but we get the job done. And I think also when, you know, they're recruiting and trying to retain, they should do this, you know, across a variety of channels. Yeah. And employees should be offered a range of benefits, you know, choices. Yeah. I might not want a uh, um, 401k because, you know, I don't, I'm not thinking about the future. What if I just want stocks or I want, you know, something else? There should be a lot of op- options provided that might cater to the needs of this you know, diverse workspace. Yeah, there's no one size fits all. There is no one size. No and one I, and I, I'm, I'm glad for this generation just pointing a lot of the weaknesses. And the same way that the forthcoming generation will, will point out to a lot of the weaknesses, we yeah. learn as we go. And we do better. Um, we do better. Very, very true. It's kind of like parenting. So, um, I work as a professor in a university and I'll let you know that academia is usually the last you know <laughs> <laughs> the last institution I that know. is sensitive to change before I, COVID yeah. you know it was so difficult to get permission to work from home because it was seen that you know, even though I can work anywhere you know, I don't run a clinic anymore I don't do clinical practice anymore it was and I I had this vexation in my spirit every time I would like to ask to work from home it was almost as if I was trying to cheat, you know, the employer. Yeah. So when COVID happened, I was super excited in a way because I was, okay, now all of you know, you don't want us to be flexible, right? They started even encouraging it. Before, before I, I wanted to get Zoom for, you know, meetings before, before COVID. Yeah. I had to go through this paperwork. They wouldn't pay for it. So I ended up paying for Zoom for a really? whole year on my, yeah. But guess what? My institution now has, now has Zoom, you know, um, they used to have it before, but they had like some, very weird roles. Anyway, it's academia, so I'm not very quite. Surprised I know. I know a little bit about the uh, because I did. I did lecture in the university for a year. Oh, so you, you know just how those so, red tips work. I now everybody's know, all about you know, you know, flexibility. Oh, I, they will say please don't come to the work to the office because of safety. And I'm here sipping my tea like, oh yeah, really, you know. <laughs> and I pray that when when we fully open back up, I pray we don't lose this flexibility because. This, we got an email recently from the president of the university. Productivity has gone up a lot. We even, I think they had like 22.2 million more dollars in really? grants. And yeah. and yeah, just for the past year alone, you should have taken a, you know, a nose dive. And I bet you that the reason people have become more productive is the flexibility. Yeah. And I hope that we don't lose that part. So I'm curious, you know, before the COVID pandemic, remote, you know, work was gaining popularity, except in some places like academia. But it's now gradually being accepted as a future of work, especially among Gen Z. They've been talking about it for years. And I think COVID was, couldn't have come at a better time. And I hate to talk about COVID in a positive way, but, you know, it has some good parts that, that you know, we've learned from COVID. So especially among Gen Z and part of the millennial generation who seek flexibility and a work-life blend, 
rather than the traditional work-life balance. What can employers and organizations like mine do to evolve with this growing trend and meet up with employer, employees' um, satisfaction in this regard? Just, uh, just keep the momentum of what's going right now. Well, I would say that we exercise some caution because not everybody is um, wants to work from home um, permanently. Some people's home situations do not allow it uh, to to they can't really be effective or efficient working from home. So for someone like me, I say I've pra- practically worked from home. I'll say for the better part of four and a half years anyway, even before COVID. So this is how I've always worked for almost five years now. Um, so it's not new to me. But if you might say that example, what, what was then new to me is having everybody else at home. Because in the past, I'm working from home. I've got my, you know, workstation at home. But then, you know, my kids go to school. Um, my husband goes to work. And I'm at home doing my work. But now everybody's at home. Everybody wants snacks. People are expecting lunch. And I'm thinking, I didn't have to do this before. I just had to focus on my work. You know, um, I didn't have to cater to everybody else uh, or take everybody else into consideration. So I would say that ask your people what they want to do, and then make a decision off the back of that. Don't I don't think you should take we should take a one size fits all approach. Don't ask everybody to come back into work. That's going to be problematic. Some people have worked in this way now for one year plus, and they want to maintain some some aspects of that because they've seen how very how really you know well it has worked. Some people have struggled through it. Some people have mental health issues, and they are struggling with the four walls of their house. And not everybody's housing situation is ideal for working from home. So um, and that is quite common with the younger generation. Um, they might not be able to afford a place that would allow them to have like a proper desk and everything. And they may have been working from the dining table, or maybe they're still living at home, or maybe they're living in shared accommodation. So I don't think those kind of people would want to work from home permanently. So some sort of hybrid solution um, would be better. So I have clients who are now looking for co-working spaces. Instead of paying for a full floor, to have everybody into the office. So they're going down the route of having a co-working space where you can book the days you want to come in. And then um, you can then come in on, so that might be two days for me or two days for or three days for, or one day a month for some people or maybe once a week. So, but provide an opportunity where people can kind of mix and match as a system. That way you still reap the reward of people having the flexibility and being able to be really efficient with the work that they're doing. Um, and also they still have that face-to-face interaction, which some people so desperately crave. So um, I would I would say that is how employers should position it. And also it's a, fi- it's a good financial, it makes good financial sense. You're paying leads for a whole building before. I know, right? Now you don't have to do that. Um, yeah. Although we're saying now that some employers are saying everybody should just come in. Um, and that's really, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm not ready. <laughs> um, but you know ha- have some sort of hybrid solution uh, and then for those who still want to stay at home support them in doing that obviously if it's not a role that requires them to be in the office all the time so for example clinicians i don't see i can understand why some of them need to be in but like for office staff if they don't need to be in support them in terms of if you've not already done so look at where they're working some people might some employers are paying x amounts towards office equi- home office equipment for their staff so offer that. Well, I said that by now you have done that because they've been working from home for almost... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if you haven't, it's an opportunity to still look at that and say, okay, how can we support you to be able to work efficiently from home? So that's how, what I would say. Um, and I think that, you know, everyone can reap the benefits of that. I agree with you. Thank you so much for that reminder. Flexibility, hybrid, basically offering what people might want. And... We all have the goal of the organization in mind. We know what the, the purpose is. We already have, you know, a task to do. How we get it done, leave that to us. As long as we're all working and there's, you know, output being generated, then that's okay. And, you know, we're not, you know, wasting time or stealing company time. So thanks for all of that reminder. I, I don't know if you had any final words as we round up. What of advice you have for, I guess, you know, the people of what they call the work generation? Yeah, I would say that keep being woke. Um, it might be, it might be that um, 
ask questions, you know, everyone's not going to be happy about it, but it's just the world we live in. Um, but make sure that in your wokeness, um, make sure that there is a, there's an authenticity to it as well. Because I see a lot of people just jumping on bandwagons and say, oh, you know, this is who I am. Make sure this is really who you are. Um, and then just, you know, and then also the, the way you, people can tell who, who the real people, who the, who, who's being real and who's not being real anyway. So kind of in, in place of doing that, you know, maintain some kind of authenticity, you know, for yourself. Um, there's no, relationships are also very important. So in the process of trying to put, put across our awareness and, everything that we know and uh, being digital natives and we're very good with social media. We know about computers. Don't let your relationships break down because you think, um, you know, other people don't know as much as you do or you think, oh, they should be getting in and they're not. And just remember that we see a human and, you know, we're living in this world together. So build your relationships um, because it will really serve you for the future. Um, it, nobody knows tomorrow, as they're saying. So they will really serve you. Um, you might go on to do great things, which I have no doubt a lot of young people will go on to do, but you would find that very quickly as time goes on that relationships are what are, what are going to take, what's going to take you further. You don't have to start from scratch every single time, but if you haven't built that relationship, you don't have that social capital. What can you build on? Um, mm. So that's just, that's some of the things that I would kind of, round up with those are great words to live by yes um to the work people listen to this like you said keeping yourself and don't let anybody look down on you because of age no. and don't look down on other people because of their age as well we all have a lot to learn from each other your voice matters you you are going to change the world and we can all get there together because of just you know just who you are and i i'm going to wrap this up by saying that in that spirit of learning from one another we all need the work ethics and loyalty of the boomer. We need the revenue generating ways of the Gen X. We need to learn a lot from the millennials and their independence and purpose driven fierceness. And for my lovely Gen Z, we need their tech adoption, innovative ways, their entrepreneurship, social responsibility, and you know, um, diversity. As you can all learn, we all as as you can all see, we all need each other. Yes, and this yes. wraps up this conversation. Um, before you go, tell us a little bit about your podcast. I know you and um, your husband started this lovely podcast to help support, you know, black parents with, you know, special need kids. Can you tell us also where to find you and all of that kind of fancy stuff? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's a part of our own wokeness, I would say. <laughs> so we started a podcast um uh, and this is targeted at parents, uh, black parents of special needs children in the UK. Uh, and that came about in the first UK lockdown uh, because we're just speaking to a few people. And also we've noticed that we do a lot of networking in the special needs community because of our daughter uh, who has um, complex medical needs. But we don't see a lot of people like us. Um, we don't, we go for weekend retreats and all things, you know, or, you know, all these things, but we don't really see a lot of black people engaging with that. And they're like a lifeline for us because we've made friends, um, and we've made connections through, through those networking. But we want to create that within, uh, the special needs black community in the UK. Most of the black people we're commit- connected to online are from the US for some reason. We don't really see our UK people that much. So they'll come out after this. They'll come out after this, I believe. Yes. I mean, we're meeting a few more now, thankfully. So we've created a network called Blacks. It's quite a, net, a mouthful, but try right? Black Special Needs Parents Support Network. So it's like name says, just a network to support parents of black children or mixed children uh, who have special needs. Um, and this is aimed at the parents. So a lot of support is available for the children, but not a lot for the parents. And I think that parents sometimes they need it. You know, we need quite a lot of it. So it place us to network, um, to share ideas, and just for them to know that they're not alone, and also to remove some of the problems of stigmatization, which unfortunately we still have within our community for um, for special for special needs. Uh, shouldn't be, but it is the way the world is. Um, so we can remove that, so they can see that you know you can't you can have a special needs child, but you, it doesn't, it's not the end of life as it is. You can still you know flourish in your own way. You just have to find out 
how. So our podcast is on bsnpsn.org. It's available on other platforms, I believe. Uh, so you can go and listen to us there. We talk about, you know, different topics and it's quite informal. So we're a friendly bunch. It's quite informal. So there's nothing to formal there. So ho- hopefully everybody can find um, something there. And even if you don't have a special needs child, you're just your grandparents or a friend or you just want to support us, then yeah, come on board. We're on Instagram and Facebook. But if you go on the website, it's all listed on there, bsnpsn.org. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to connecting with you. And all of that will be in the show notes, by the way. And yes, um, Tutu and her husband, um, Kenny, they have such a lovely dynamic. I have listened to a couple of their episodes, and oh. there's so much to learn. Um, I, I just love them. I love them. And I think it's oh, a wonderful resource. No. We should bring you back on the show to come talk about your podcast and how we can best support you. But as you know, we always support you as well. Um, yes, all right, guys, that was it. Um, catch you guys on another episode of the More Simple Podcast. And thank you so much, Tutu. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Morrisable Podcast. Well, guess what? There's plenty more where that came from. So visit our website at www.mosibyl.com. That is www.mosibyl.com, where you can find hours of other binge-worthy episodes just like this one. And while you're at it, please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Podbean as it encourages other awesome people like you to listen to the podcast as well. We are now officially on Podbean. It has an app. You can catch up on missed episodes and also get a notification when we have new episodes. Do you have a question for our guest, feedback on the episode, or a suggestion for a future guest? Then please get in touch with us by sending us an email at talktomo at mostable.com or connect with us via Instagram at the Moral Civil Podcast. Cannot wait to hear from you and thank you so much for always listening. Mm-hmm.